You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and I'm so glad you're joining us today. And my special guest today is New York Times bestselling author Susan Wilson. Susan will be uh, talking to us today about her uh, recently released book, A Man of His Own. Every dog needs a man of his own, so that's going to be exciting to get a dog factor in there, so we're always glad to hear that on Pet Life Radio. So another great book by Susan, and we're interested in talking to her uh, more detail about the book and her writing in general, so it's going to be a great episode. Everybody, uh, so just hang tight. Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back to talk to Susan Wilson after these messages. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. I'm not much of a reader, but I do wish I were more well-read. There are so many great books coming out. I wish I could find a way to keep up. Audible.com makes it easy to stay well-informed and catch up on your reading simply by listening. Audiobooks from Audible turn downtime into uptime. You'll be more productive and become well-read. Now I'm able to catch up on all the great books I've been wanting to read. With Audible, I feel smarter. Pet Life Radio listeners, try Audible.com now and get your first 30 days of Audible Listener Gold Membership plan free. And get a free audiobook. Choose from over 100,000 titles. To get this great deal, go to AudibleDeals.com. That's AudibleDeals.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and joining me now is author Susan Wilson. Susan, welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Well, thank you so much, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's our pleasure. You know, congratulations on another great book, A Man of His Own. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about the book, the storyline, and uh, uh, we'll take it from there. Well, it's essentially, uh, it could be construed as an historical novel in that the bulk of it takes place during, immediately before, during, and after World War II. What uh, the key players are Rick Stanton, who is an up and coming baseball player with designs on finally making it into the major leagues, and his new bride, Francesca, and their dog, who is Pax. Pax is a dog that uh, Rick adopted, found uh, in an alleyway, and who was his, you know, chief companion until Francesca. And along comes World War II. Rick goes off to war. Francesca is left with Pax, and they form a bond. But that bond is upset when she and Rick together decide that the Pax, the best use of Pax is for him to become a war dog. And mm-hmm. that circumstance introduces Pax to another human character, and that is Keller Nicholson, who is kind of a tough, had a tough life. Uh, he's a young man. He has been in reform school. He's been essentially uh, made be slave labor f- with a crusty old uncle who's put him to work, and he sees the war as a way of getting out of that. And whereas Rick sees it as an interruption in his plans and Pax sees it as what the heck is going on here. But Keller and Pax then form a bond. So we now have, you know, basically four characters. One of them is Dog. And at the end of the war, it is time for Pax to come home and Keller is absolutely crushed that he now has to give this dog back. The circumstance, however, is that um, Rick comes back from the war not only are his dreams shattered, but his body is, and his and his soul and his spirit, and he is struggling. And when Keller comes back with the dog, they invite him to stay on as an aide, and there becomes this sort of love triangle with four characters, and that is, you know, Keller and Pax and Francesca and Rick and Pax, and it just goes around and around. So that's sort of the essential part of the story. Yeah, so a lot of dynamics there, a lot of uh, twists and, and turns in the uh, this novel as well. Yeah, absolutely. So as a writer, how do you go about coming up with uh, you know writing this book? I mean, uh, compared to your other books that you've done, I mean, how do you sit mm-hmm. down and get this idea and frame it around events and people? Well, I think the the key thing is it, it took me about three tries to actually figure out what the story was that I wanted to tell. Uh, which is not unusual for writers. I think you often go in thinking, I'm going to write a story about X, Y, and Z, and you find out that actually the story you're writing about is about A, B, and C. But I always did have these characters, and and the the heart of it 
is actually why Pax has gone to war. And I think the interesting thing about that was kind of a, a random discovery on my part is that war dogs during World War II were not bred for it as they are now. They were pets. They were the farm dogs. They were people's companion dogs. And a, a call went out for their volunteering into the service by an organization called Dogs for Defense. And when I discovered this, that these dogs were actually people's pets that were volunteered, donated, I thought that is the story right there. I mean, how do you do something like that? How do I take, you know, my, my terrier and say, okay, now you're my pet, get off the couch, you're going to war. And it was just a fascinating detail that really was the nugget of the, of the story, the nugget of the idea of the story. Yeah. How do people do this? And then what happens afterwards? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was just listening to my terriers barking downstairs. So I'm thinking, hmm, w- wonder when the next war is. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've thought about it myself with mine. Like, hey, come on. <laughs> yeah, they always was, wait till the inopportune yeah. time to start barking, too. Yes, they do. That's fascinating. So how does the characters in the book, how do they make that decision? Do they uh, view it as a patriotic type thing to do? Or, um, you know, I, I couldn't imagine that in, in today's uh, society. Yes. I think that's exactly it. In today's society, we can't imagine it. We don't even call ourselves owners, much less masters anymore. We are pet parents. But in, you know, during the period of World War II, I think the, the thing that we have to keep in mind is that the war effort, and I, I always picture that in, in capital letters, was so critical. And people were just sacrificing right and left. And they really did want um, to, to help in any way that they could. And that, you know, went from, you know, women going into the workforce to collecting tin cans to saving grease to, you know, everything. They didn't have much. They were on rations, uh, you know, ration stamps and, and had, you know, you used up your gas a lot and then you didn't get any more gas. You had to wait. And I think that we don't really understand sacrifice in this culture now. But to answer your question, it was a hard, I mean, I'm sitting here looking at it from, you know, 21st century eyes, and I'm putting myself in the place of two people. First of all, Francesca has sent her husband to war, and now she thinks she's got to send her dog, and it's extremely difficult for her, and she, you know, really struggles with the idea. But at the end of it, her husband, who is in the middle of of the conflict, says, this is the right thing to do, and they do it. And, you know, the good news for the for the dogs that were volunteered is if they survived, they went home, just like veterans. They went home to their families who won't, if they wanted them back. Exactly. We're in today's, mm-hmm. uh, today's situation where they're not mm-hmm. sort of volunteered, they're bred into it, like you'd mentioned, it, it, or trained into it. They don't right. always come back. It, they don't. I, I know. And it is. It's just a different... Uh, I mean, they were sending all kinds of dogs. It was, it's really kind of a, a fun bit of history when uh, this call went out. And it was actually some women, a, a woman, and I can't remember her name now. I don't have my notes in front of me, who um, called up a, a reporter, I think it was. And she said, the dog fancy has to get into this conflict. And that's what they called it, the dog fancy. And she was a <laughs> poodle breeder. And she said, we must do something. And they came up with this idea that the military didn't buy, didn't buy into it. And finally, they were convinced, the military is convinced to take on a couple of hundred dogs and see what happened. And of course, they were wonderfully successful. So the call goes out and thousands of dogs are sent to war. Not all of them made the cut. A lot of them got sent home. And they eventually were a little bit more selective and they wanted certain types of dogs as opposed to everybody's mutt. But it was it was quite an event and quite an effort. And um, I just found it incredibly fascinating. Yeah, definitely fascinating. So you're talking about the idea, the initial idea and concept, the characters, et cetera, that you had for the book. Mm -hmm. How do you as a, a writer, as a novelist, go about doing your research on this? How do you determine, okay, what do I really need to do to make this authentic mm-hmm. as possible? In this particular case, I was really lucky to, um, you know, God bless the internet, uh, you know, you <laughs> Google things, which is how I found out about the Dogs for Defense in the first place. But there was a book uh, written by a man probably in 1954, so it's a very old book. I was not able to actually get a physical copy of it for myself. I did get one through uh, the Boston Library. And I read every word, and he went through every detail of how that had happened. But I did get hold of the actual Army war manual that covered war dogs. Wow. And I mean, that was a trip. That was, it, that was wonderful. So I was actually able to read down all of their specifications for equipment and handling and training and all this other stuff. So I got a real 
I had what we call research rapture. I suddenly knew all this stuff, and so I put it in the book, and my editor said, I think there's a little too much of this in there. <laughs> so I had to pull a lot of it out. And okay, well, you know, so you don't have to know every single detail about how high they can jump. But, you know, it was it was great. It really was. And uh, right. a third book that I encountered had, had was a photographic, really uh, a pictorial essay on all of the equipment and the dogs and it had some wonderful photographs and it was just it was just a real treat so i had a lot of fun digging around and all that yeah and i think it's important i think that you know i know from a novice standpoint as a novice say a novice writer or someone who hasn't published their first novel you know it's hard enough to come up with the idea and the concept let alone doing the research and making sure you're you're accurate because if you're not when you say that uh, people will call you on it Oh, yes, they will. And that makes me very nervous. And, and I will say, in all honesty, that most of the time I go into research kind of backward. I write the story and then I go and I hope that I'm, I'm right. And then I start doing the research to either substantiate what I've thought or corroborate it or correct it. But I, I tend to want to write sort of organically and not get too bogged down in the research normally. Now, in this particular case, the research kind of was just right there for me, and it was just great. So it went along simultaneously for once. For once, I actually did it the right way. <laughs> well, I think it's a, I think the way, I, well, you obviously are doing it the right way, period, because you've had a great deal of success, obviously. So big kudos on that. But I think it, you know, it's very valid what you were just saying. Write it and then go back and make sure you're, you're tidying it mm-hmm. down, you're tying the bows on yeah. it, et cetera, because that's sort of the way with writing in general. You, know, you shouldn't be, in my opinion, and from what I've heard from others, is mm-hmm. you know, don't get too caught up on the misspellings and the editing and all that while you're mm-hmm. writing it. Once you've got it in place, right. or at least struggle over those commas. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it makes it hard, you know, if you're doing it on a Word document or something like that, and you see your spell mm-hmm. check pop up every three seconds, like mine does. Yeah, that's you, you try not to see right. that. <laughs> I, yeah, it's, that's actually distracting. It really is. But on the other hand, sometimes it's kind of good. You see that word, and you say, "No, I think that's right. I think spell check is wrong." And then you go to the dictionary and you find another word, and you think, "Oh, I want to use that one." So you know, it's um, it, it's a two-edged sword. Sometimes you do need to sort of stop and assess, but uh, for the most part, I think it's nice to you know get the story down on the pages and then go back and and make your changes and fixes and all of that. And and frankly, that's my favorite part. I mean the. The hard part is getting the story down. The, the fun part is going back and editing it and cleaning it up and sculpting it into something readable. And there, you there you go. All mm-hmm. right. Okay, well, we're going to take a, a quick little commercial break here, but we're going to come back and talk to Susan Wilson a little bit more about her latest book, A Man of His Own, and talk to her about some of the other writing and how she puts all this great stuff down on, the, on paper. So uh, everybody just hang tight. We're going to come right back after these messages. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Swipe It's a revolutionary new product that literally swipes away cat hair from virtually any surface. You know, most of us struggle with a roller or vacuum cleaner to clean up cat hair, but anyone who has tried either of these knows they just don't work very well. But Swipe It's patent pending glove has a magnetic-like quality that removes cat hair from almost everything. And best of all, Swipe It's is machine washable, so you can use it over and over again. To order, just visit SwipeIt's.com. That's S-W-I-P-E-T Yes, a simple solution for shedding. Hi, this is Tim Link, animal communicator and pet expert and host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have you ever wanted to know what your pet is really thinking? Do you want to find out if they truly understand what you're trying to tell them? Ever wish you could build a better understanding and closer relationship with your pet? Well, now you can. Learning to communicate with animals is a four-part on-demand workshop. In the workshop, you'll learn the essential techniques that are necessary to communicate with animals, including what is animal communication, breathing correctly to achieve the perfect state to communicate with your animals at a deeper level, using guided meditation exercises and method to communicate with animals, and how to send and receive information from your animals. So if you're wanting to learn how to communicate and connect with your animals at a deeper level, visit PetLifeRadio.com forward slash workshop and purchase and download Learning to Communicate with Animals. You'll be glad you did. Coast to coast and around the world, it's All Behave with Arden Moore. Find out why cats and dogs do the things they do and get the latest buzz from wagging tongues and tails in Rin Tin Tinseltown. 
from famous pet experts and best-selling authors to television and movie stars, you'll get great tail-wagging pet tips and have a fur-flying fun time. All behave with America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and I'm here with Susan Wilson talking to her about her latest book, A Man of His Own. Now, Susan, we talked a little bit before break about how to put together the book, the storyline, these type of things. Can you share with us a little bit about the challenges of putting together this book, especially since uh, the success of some of the other uh, novels that you put together? This is a book that really struggled um, in some ways because I knew sort of what I wanted to do, and I actually started off with a book that looked like it was going to be a retrospective of a man who is an elderly man on the floor waiting for either rescue or death and his retrospective of his life. And I piled through a quite a number of pages of that, and I you know, had a whole host of characters and all, and it just wasn't quite working. I mean, I knew he wanted to be, he would be a dog handler in World War II and he'd have this, you know, this memory of this dog, but it just wasn't catching. And so that was one of the challenges was sometimes, even though you really, you fall in love with your words, the story's not there. And that kind of was where we were. It was just not working as too much retrospective and the characters were not building. And so I stopped and I thought, you know what, we've got to do something else. And it sounds a little trite, but, you know, the, the Rick Stanton character was going to be an extremely minor character. He was actually possibly going to already be dead at the beginning of this book. And then he took on a life, and he, he is the one who found the dog. And, you know, it just it was just one of those strange, writerly happenstances where you, you're you working with the, you're kind of barking up the wrong tree, and when you turn around, there's the real one. And that's kind of how, how the challenge was to actually abandon a good chunk of book and just, you know, start all over again. And once I did that, once I recognized that the, the actual character who needed the most attention was a minor character, it flew. It, it was, I did it in about three months after wow. I worked on it for about a year. Wow, so you worked on it for about a year, but it took three months once it took hold just to, to get it done yeah. because the, you had to the right piece. Just turn it around and say, you know, rip that out, throw that away, get rid of this character, change this character's name entirely so that I've got a new vision of him and go and go from there, and it worked. Wow, very mm. nice, very fascinating. Yeah. So as a, uh, you know, a New York Times bestselling author, you've had great success with your uh, previous uh, novels, uh, mm-hmm. One Good Dog and uh, The Dog Who Danced. How do you build on that success? How do you take that and keep that momentum going? You pray a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you hope it. <laughs> no, I'm all serious. I mean, it is it is a momentum, and I think any false step I make is going to lose the momentum. But I think it's building a, a fan base to to be you know kind of blunt about readership, and I feel exceedingly blessed to have met through contacts through the website and through Facebook and all of that a, a host of people who really love the idea of these stories and and I'm just hoping that they remain faithful to me <laughs> and and continue to enjoy it or let me know if I'm not doing a good job I mean that's okay too let me know if I'm I'm not you know sustaining that kind of momentum um, but it's it's a wonderful thing I mean it, it happened by chance that I've, I've found this genre and I'm loving it and it's uh, it's a lot of fun and I'm you know I like I said I really do appreciate the steadfast loyalty of, of many 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 readers who are usually you know typically dog lovers I will say that that's the largest group that I know of but also people just enjoy a, a good yarn as a friend of mine used to say there you go. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And you do a great job with that. Well, thank you. So tell us about, you mentioned your terrier. You got to give us names and examples. Oh. How many birds, other <laughs> My terrier friends is, around. <laughs> yes, she is a, um, we don't really know what she is. She's, she looks like a giant Jack Russell or a miniature wolfhound. We can't just quite decide what she is. She's a white and black terrier hound mix, probably. That I, I can't say I rescued her because she had never suffered. She was born in the shelter and then shipped up from down south to a local shelter, and she was available, and it's been, you know, it's been going on, oh, it's 11 years now that we've had her, so she um, rules the roost, absolutely rules the roost. Um, there you go. So. Does she try to be your muse, or does she uh, force you to get away from the uh, the computer every once in a while to get outside? You know, she does. Uh, she has an inner clock that is 
wound tight and I will go up to my desk at a certain hour with my coffee and she has a bed in, in my office and she goes right to bed and I can work. I can go back up and down, get more coffee, whatever. She just stays in the bed. And then at 11 o'clock, she gets up and she goes over to me and she sits there and she does that, you know, nose down, eyes up thing where she just stares mm-hmm. at me. Mm-hmm. And if I don't pay any of your attention, her nose goes under the elbow and she flips my arm. And if I don't pay any attention, she starts butting me with her paws. I'm, you know, she just says, it's time. It's time for the walk. And so I, I okay, okay, I'll go. And we do our, our mile and a half or whatever it is. There you but go. She's funny. I mean, it's like, ele- I, okay, it must be 11, Bonnie, sitting there staring at me. <laughs> 11 o'clock around the dot, so it gets her yep. exercise, but it also gets you up and, and gives you a little it mental does. Break it does. As well. oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and uh, it's it, sometimes it's the best part of my day, although today it was raining, but we did it anyway. And- That's right. <laughs> Rain or shine, yeah, we had monsoons uh, down here in South today, so it was a, uh, uh, a pleasurable day, especially when you get two uh, schnauzers who really prefer ooh. not to be in the rain, so it was a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Schnauzers are but, great. Hey, I have a friend who has a little schnauzer. Just got a schnauzer puppy to go with the other one she has, so they're great little dogs. Oh, boy. Well, there's yeah. a lot of sleep hours right there for sure. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, Susan, once everybody picks up a copy of A Man of His Own, once they read through it and everything, mm-hmm. what do you hope they walk away with? I would say I hope that they walk away satisfied. You know, mm-hmm. we, we close the, you know, shut the book and say, that was a good story. I, I related to those people, or I at least believed that they existed, I, you know, that, and uh, also maybe think a little bit about how, you know, the sacrifices of our forefathers, so to speak, in during that, that conflict and on and on through current day, um, these men and women and dogs have just, you know, sacrificed and have their lives completely changed by um, conflict. Yeah, you did a great job with the book. I, you know, the, building oh, the characters, you. relatable to the characters. Got a dog mm-hmm. in there as a, a main theme, mm-hmm. which is always a win-win for me. And the historical nature behind it, and the, the uh, actual facts and everything behind mm-hmm. it. So it's uh, it's a learning lesson as well as an enjoyable read. So so Welcome. great job, Susan. Thank you so much. Yeah. So how can uh, people find out more about you and what you have going on, and uh, where can they get the book? Well, they can get the book uh, in the usual large outlets. <laughs> that you can connect to on your, your computer or otherwise, Barnes & Noble being one and Amazon the other. Also, hopefully, local independent bookstores, which I'm a great fan, so I recommend always trying them first. And All Else Fails, the library is uh, always a good place. Yes, everybody pick yeah. up a copy of, of the book, A Man of His Own. Follow Susan Wilson, everything going on there. And uh, as you mentioned before, you're on, I'm assuming you're on Facebook mm-hmm. and all the wonderful I'm sites. On Facebook. Yeah, Susan Wilson author, I think is how you, you have to find it. Or I think if you just, I don't know, I've never done it. but And I also do have a website, which is SusanWilsonWrites.com. Okay, everybody, great. So check out mm-hmm. SusanWilsonWrites.com or go to Susan Wilson Author on Facebook. Pick up a copy, go to your local stores, go to your independents, order it online. You guys are going to be really satisfied. Another great job, uh, Susan. Uh, the book's okay. called A Man of His Own, a wonderful novel. And uh, it was a pleasure, uh, pleasure talking to you. Oh, it's always a pleasure talking with you, Tim. That's great. All right, well, we're going to come up to the end of the show here tonight. But I thank everyone for listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. I want to send a, a big special thank you to our sponsors and producers for making this show possible. To find out more about me, Tim Link, and the other guests I've interviewed on the Animal Rights Show, you can go to Pet Life Radio. It's PetLifeRadio.com, and you can download the episodes and listen to all the wonderful interviews. And while you're there, check out the uh, other wonderful hosts and shows on Pet Life Radio. It's PetLifeRadio.com. If you have any questions for me, comments, or ideas for the show, you can send me an email. You can send me an email at Tim at PetLifeRadio.com. Tim at PetLifeRadio.com, and I'll be glad to answer your questions, uh, entertain your comments, and bring on the people you want to hear from the most. So until next time, write a great story about the animals in your life, share it in a blog, article, or in a book, and who knows, you may be the next guest on Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have a great day. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.